On August 15, 1944, troops of the U.S. 7th Army, 6th Corps, consisting of three veteran divisions from Italy, the 3rd, 36th, and 45th, stormed ashore on the Riviera beaches of southern France. This was Operation Dragoon. In the following weeks, these 7th Army soldiers, commanded by Lieutenant General Alexander M. Sandy Patch, drove north up the Rhone River Valley while clearing German defenders to the west. The key French ports of Marseille and Toulon were freed, and dozens of other French cities in the south were liberated. A link-up with General Patton's 3rd Army troops, which had been advancing east from the Normandy beachhead, occurred at Dijon in south-central France, September 15th. But the Germans did not simply fall back. The Nazis showed every intention of fighting savagely for every mile of eastern France still in their hands. They used all available mobile equipment in their strong effort to stem the Allied advance along the whole battle line. In a concerted attempt to stabilize their defense, the Nazis fought stubbornly, fully aware that if this stand were unsuccessful, the Allies would, before long, penetrate into Germany itself. In their determined defense, they used their newest, most improved weapons. The Allies hammered continuously at the Nazi line, which had stiffened abruptly. The Allied attack was not quite strong enough. kept by lengthening supply lines. The Allies kept up their attack on all sections of the front in an all-out drive toward the German frontier. Simply the fall period was to become a memorable one because of a series of bitterly contested battles, usually conducted under the most trying conditions of weather and terrain. Fighting throughout the front, from Switzerland to the mouth of the Rhine, descended during the late fall months to the dirtiest kind of infantry slugging. Advances were slow and laborious. Gains were ordinarily measured in terms of yards rather than miles. Operations became mainly a matter of endurance, stamina, and courage. Because of depletion of their infantry strength, divisions quickly exhausted themselves in action. Our offensive strength fell off markedly. American troops advanced yard by yard in the drive to push the enemy back within his own borders. The French First Army led the attack on the Belfort Gap and breached it within a week. Its leading troops quickly reached the Rhine. This turned the flank of the German position in the Vosges Mountains and forced a general withdrawal. We were disposed along a line which, beginning in the north on the banks of the Rhine, stretched 500 miles southward to the border of Switzerland. divisions were short in infantry replacements. And in total numerical strength of ground forces, the Germans still had a marked advantage. We could, on the average, deploy less than one division to each 10 miles of front.
didn't play too rough. The way some of them carried on. In mid-November, elements of the U.S. 6th Army Group drove rapidly toward Strasbourg, a French city situated on the banks of the Rhine. On the 23rd of November, the French 2nd Armored Division reached Strasbourg. But the city was not completely won until four days later, after a bitter Nazi defense. With Germany in view just across the Rhine, the Allied forces in Strasbourg redoubled their attack against the Nazis on the opposite shore in the little German town of Kehl. Meanwhile, the 44th and 79th American divisions made swift progress toward Aganol to the north against stubborn resistance. The enemy was not quitting France without a fight. The Nazis surrendered at Agano on December 12th. Allow any Germans to remain west of the river in the Upper Rhine Plain would be certain to cause us later embarrassment. All along the Allied front, the men began to show the effects of the months of battle strain. As the infantry replacement problem became acute, we resorted to every kind of expedient to keep units up to strength. All these measures, however, failed to keep filled the ranks of the infantry formations. As winter approached, the Allied commanders were faced with added problems. The infantry, which in all kinds of warfare habitually absorbs the bulk of the losses, was now taking practically all of them. These were by no means due to enemy action alone. In other respects, too, the infantry suffered an abnormal percentage of casualties. Because of exposure, the cases of frostbite, trench foot, and respiratory diseases were far more numerous among infantry soldiers than others. To keep those casualties to a minimum, every precaution possible was taken against the spread of these afflictions. Maintenance of morale was a problem of first importance. We established divisional centers in the rear of the lines where a company or a battalion could occasionally get out of the fighting zone and the men could secure baths, warm beds, and a day or two of rest. The effect of prolonged combat is always bad. If a unit is brought out of line before the processes of physical and mental fatigue have gone too far, it can be ready for re-entry into battle far sooner than one that has been kept in line too long. Moreover, periodic rests for the frontline soldier have a splendid effect upon morale. And in any kind of warfare, troop morale is always a decisive factor. During World War I, the American Army had received recreation and entertainment assistance from a variety of civilian organizations. We depended upon the USO and the Red Cross. The services of these devoted people to soldiers in the field were beyond praise. We also established a furlough plan which gave at least some men the opportunity to go back to Paris. To help make the GIs stay in the city as enjoyable as possible, the Red Cross opened several allied clubs, which proved a haven for soldiers confused by a strange language. 
But the foreign flavor of Paris had a universal appeal to visiting GIs and those lucky enough to be stationed there. To a combat soldier, a trip to the French capital seemed like a visit to another world. A 10-day pass in Paris worked wonders in terms of the GI's morale, an especially important factor at this critical time. The liberated sled. It was a reminder that the holidays were just around the corner, and the young man's mind just naturally turned to his winter wardrobe. The accent that season was on the conservative. Something in a double-breasted and neutral colors. Just the thing for an afternoon stroll. that a man named Sherman was wrong. My job was uh, to see to it that they had a new toothbrush and a cot, maybe a book to read when they came over from the east bank to the west bank of the Moselle for a little rest. We brought them over one company at a time because that was all the regiment could spare from the line at any one time. Somebody had tapped them on the shoulder and said, all right, boy, you're going back across the river for 24 hours rest. And here they were where they could rest. They just couldn't believe it. Here they were for just 24 hours without war. Everything was down to essentials, counted out like dollar bills through a teller's window. One night's sleep, one day's hot meals, one clean change of underwear, one clean pair of pants, one shave, one hot shower, one movie. I used to wonder what was the best of that day. Was it the chance for him to write home, a hot shower, or that long-legged girl on the screen? Whatever it was, all of it was over by morning. They were going back with their one clean suit of underwear, their hot shower, their clean shave, and the good night's sleep. Back across the Moselle to their holes in the ground. And the shells. By that time, we knew we were going to see a winter campaign. There was no way out of it. The Germans were dug in, and they were tough. And it was plain that until we got a lot stronger, we weren't going anyplace. The squadron was operating whenever it could. There wasn't a lot of flying. We were iced up and fed up. Suppose you're having a swell time in Paris, my cousin wrote me, with all that perfume and silk stockings and that champagne. Uh, they called our end of the line south. We were in the Vosges Mountains with the American 7th Army. But it was very little warmth in this south. I recalled with pleasure the Mediterranean where we had landed in August. Oh, but the memories do not keep one warm. Before, but pretty soon I found myself smoking as high as a pack a day. 
I worried about that old law of percentages. My company was melting away. You look up one day and be fighting alongside a stranger. It was a lonesome feeling. On the German front, to aid the men of the United States 36th Division's lost battalion, shells are loaded with food and medicine instead of explosives to be fired across enemy lines. Trapped for five days without supplies, the lost battalion is enabled to hold out only with the help of this cannon sent aid. American troops of Japanese descent, men who have distinguished themselves repeatedly in the European war, move out to rescue the battalion. In heavy fighting, they advance to cut an escape route through the Nazi lines. German prisoners are taken as the breakthrough is made, and men of the lost battalion come back. Tired, worn, and battered, but they never gave up. The wounded are helped. Although the lost battalion's situation seemed hopeless, these men kept their fighting spirit through the long days of isolation. Adding another chapter to their record, these American-born troops of Japanese ancestry received decorations from General Dahlquist for their work in rescuing their comrades in arms. By mid-December 1944, the Allies had penetrated the German border in the Aachen sector and were threatening to push the entire battle line into Germany. If your outfit wasn't on the move, you made little plans. It was going to be as merry as you could make it. But nobody dug up that old one about home by Christmas. For most of us, a merry Christmas never did come off. Krauts had pulled another one out of the hat. The Ardennes breakthrough. It was our turn to give ground. Our turn to dig in and defend. Then give some more. back to their villages were on the roads again. The Bosch was coming back. They knew what that would mean.
As the year 1944 ends, Hitler opens a new offensive against the French front centered around Strasbourg, which had been liberated only a month before. Troubled by the fighting in the Ardennes, General Eisenhower orders an American withdrawal. General de Gaulle sends an envoy, General de Vigier, to protest to Devers, the American general commanding the sector. What was the general's attitude? He was commanding a group of armies and very anxious himself. I found he was very torn between obeying the orders of his superiors and his personal feelings, because he told me, General, I understand the French point of view because one of my grandmothers came from Strasbourg. He had tears in his eyes. And I felt that this man was absolutely tormented by the decision he had to take and that he had to obey orders. On the morning of January the 3rd, the Americans begin to carry out their orders to withdraw. Having had six weeks of freedom after three years of continual pressures, continual fear, and to know that once again the Germans were coming back, it was more than I could stand. It was panic, real terror, like I'd never felt before, not even in the bombings or anything. But to know that they were going to come back. Along with Madame Siegfried, the millions of Strasbourgers make for the interior towards the Vosges, towards the French army, for the fourth time in two generations. In deserted Strasbourg, the French freedom fighters organize the resistance. General de Vigier, who has been appointed military governor of the town, hastens to Paris to warn General Juin. Juin took me by the arm and whisked me off, and we saw General de Gaulle, who, in front of the map, made me repeat what I had learned the previous evening at Vittel. De Gaulle turned, very calm as always, to his chief of staff, saying, Juin, you will do two things. You are going first to tell Delattre to take Strasbourg into his zone and to undertake the defense of Strasbourg himself. The second thing you are going to do is to prepare two telegrams. One is to Winston Churchill, the other to Roosevelt, to tell them that I have taken the decision to defend Strasbourg, whatever happens. On January the 3rd, Churchill arrives in Paris. Drama. De Gaulle and Eisenhower are set against each other. Between policy and strategy, between good sense and sentiment, Churchill doesn't hesitate a second. With his help, De Gaulle finally convinces Eisenhower. Strasbourg must be saved. General de Latre de Tassigny is ordered to defend the town. The first French army comes down from the Vosges to relieve the Americans. Time is not on their side. German radio is announcing that in a few days the swastika will fly again over Strasbourg Cathedral. As soon as he arrives, General de Lattre reassures the civilians. Strasbourg, liberated by French soldiers, will be defended by French soldiers. On that day, January the 7th, the Germans are no more than 25 kilometers to the south of Strasbourg. They clash with the first French army, who sacrifice themselves to delay the German advance. The survivors of the French Pacific Battalion are practically annihilated, and the Germans take many prisoners. In the outskirts of Strasbourg, 
the French resistance fighters under André Marot hold the attack. For General de Lattre and General de Vigier, the situation is very serious. In the south at Obenheim, the sacrifice of the 1st Infantry Division and of the Mulrow Brigade at Kraft has stemmed the enemy's advance. But in the north, in the Kilstead region, the Germans are no more than eight miles from Strasbourg. On January the 21st, the 3rd Algerian Infantry Division, veterans of Casino, fight hand to hand in a new battle. A unit of the 2nd Armoured Division under Colonel Langlade arrives during the night, attacks and stops the German advance. Strasbourg is saved. Two weeks later, the Colmar area is cleared. On February the 11th, General de Gaulle comes to Strasbourg to attend a Te Deum at the cathedral. The long battle for the freedom of France is won. On February 19th, General Patch and General Patton launched a coordinated night attack to clear the Saar and Moselle Triangle, an island of some 300 square miles between the Saar and Moselle rivers. Three days later, the Americans had fought their way through the German defenders, and 3rd Army was driving on towards Trier, while 7th Army advanced nearer to Saarbrücken. In the drive to reach the Rhine, French 1st Army to the south protected General Patch's right flank. 7th Army continued to attack in the Saar Palatinate. 3rd Army took Trier. Men of 7th Army were poised. The stage was now set to punch into the Fatherland through the Siegfried Line. March 15th, breakthrough. 7th Army units rolled through the holes in the Siegfried Line and raced forward toward the Rhine River. Thousands of German prisoners were taken. By March 20th, the Allied armies were lined up along the western banks of the Rhine from north to south along the entire front. Hitler had ordered it defended to the death, the Volkstrom prepared to fight. It has cost dearly to get as far as the Rhine. And the war isn't over yet. As they reach the banks of the river, everyone knows, everyone feels, that down there on the other side, Germany, still formidable, is preparing for a last-ditch stand. Bradley's Central Group of Armies, U.S. 12th Army Group area, 1st Army went across the Rhine in the Remagen area, March 22nd. That night, Patton's 3rd Army crossed the river at Oppenheim. North of the Ruhr, 21st Army Group launched the main Allied attack over the Rhine. That night, around Wessel, British and American troops crossed. The morning of March 24th, the 1st Allied Airborne Army dropped 14,000 paratroopers and glidermen behind the Germans north of the city. 
On the 26th of March, 7th Army made its crossing of the Rhine at Worms. Attacks were launched in the pre-dawn darkness. The French 1st Army had crossed the Rhine at Philipsburg, 10 miles south of Mannheim, against feeble resistance. 7th Army and the French were driving deep into the Reich, rolling over scattered opposition. German defenses inside the town of Schweinfurt had stymied 7th Army's advance. Zweibrücken in the Saar is pounded by United States 7th Army weapons, including rocket-firing tanks. penetrate the ruins of Zweibrücken. Army vehicles roll through, headed for new victories on the road to Berlin. Major General John O'Daniel, 3rd Division Commander, arrives with his advance units. The industrial city of Saarbrücken, largest in the Saar Basin, is taken by men of the 7th Division of the 7th Army. Lashing out through the Siegfried Line, the 7th Army struck north for a juncture with the 3rd Army and the complete destruction of German forces in the Saar. In this building in 1935, the result of the Saar plebiscite, bringing the Saar under German control, was announced by Adolf Hitler. Ten miles southeast of the fallen Rhine bastion of Mannheim, 7th Army forces speed down the superhighway toward Heidelberg. German demolitions have destroyed all bridges over the Neckar River into the ancient German university city. Infantry support rafts transport men and vehicles. The 10th Armored and 63rd Infantry Divisions capture Heidelberg, 30th March. Unlike German cities of similar size, Heidelberg is virtually unscathed. All newer parts of the city north of the Neckar are almost unmarked. Reports on the old town south of the river indicate only light damage. Liberated Frenchmen celebrate in the streets of Heidelberg. To the northeast, General Patch's 45th Infantry Division received 12th Tactical Air Command support in the attack on Aschaffenburg. This town was reported cleared when the 3rd Army rolled through late in March, but a new fanatical stand is made by the Nazis. Bombs start huge fires. Aschaffenburg finally is taken on 3rd April. Another 7th Army Division, the 12th Armored, is driving across the Bavarian Plain in the vicinity of Würzburg. This attack on 31st March is against the town of Nasig, just below the Keen Mine River city. An estimated 250 Nazis are holding out in the town. All are reported to be youthful soldiers, 16 to 18 years old. One hour is allowed them to come out and surrender. 95 Germans give themselves up.
Interrogation reveals that these troops had only 15 days training, but their marksmanship is attested by reports from men of the 12th Armored. The battle continues against the fanatical defenders remaining inside Nasi. With the support of the tank elements, the town is entered by Negro units of the 43rd Armored Infantry Battalion. The little town is afire as it falls to Major General Roderick Allen's troops. On the motorway from Frankfurt to Nuremberg, the American 7th Army under General Patch advances in giant stride. This is Hitler's triumphal way, which leads to the sanctuary of Nazism, Nuremberg. But Nuremberg is in ruins. Now the mighty American tide rolls into Nuremberg. The Seventh Army holds the review where Hitler's great rallies were held. Here, thousands once gathered to bellow Sieg Heil when Hitler screamed. Now the vast expanse is empty except for three American soldiers who have a job to do. Watch the symbol. This man is Richard Yarchik, a member of the Wehrmacht's 36th Grenadier Division. For three months in the U.S. 7th Army's territory, he carried on espionage and sabotage under direct instructions of the Nazis while pretending to be an anti-Nazi. On April 6th, he was caught, tried, and after a full confession, sentenced to be shot to death with musketry. According to the man's confession, he was only one of a network of underground agents operating behind American lines. 18th April, the 3rd and 45th Infantry Divisions of General Patch's 7th Army begin to close in on Nuremberg. Fighting is heavy all the way in. The suburbs of Firth, Schwabach, and Schweinau are used by the Nazis as strong points and have to be burned out step by step. Fanatical fringes of SS and Wehrmacht troops are chiefly responsible for the bitter end fighting as Americans methodically destroy the defensive ring around Nuremberg. and 45th Divisions pry their way into Nuremberg from two different directions, and by 19th April are headed for a junction in the center of the city. The infantrymen find that Volkssturm troops, joining the Wehrmacht to defend the famous Nazi city, have set up a wide net of snipers' nests, which make every street a hotly contested game. Tanks move in to take over the job of blasting the snipers loose. For two days, the cleaning out process continues as Nazi after Nazi is knocked out of action. Defenders are steadily compressed under American pressure, and on 20th April, after three days of tough slugging, Nuremberg falls to the 7th Army. For more than a year, Nuremberg has been subjected to air attack by British and American heavies. Its location, deep in southern Germany, had led Hitler to move some of his armament industry there. Pounding plus three days of bitter ground fighting reduces the city to a mass of rubble and shattered walls. A 
German 88, well hidden, was blasted out of action. The Nazis had not only built up Nuremberg's industry for war, but had made the city a recreation center. It was also the site of the annual meeting of the Nazi Party Congress. The famous Nuremberg Stadium, where the annual rallies of the Hitlerites were held. A handful of SS fanatics defended it to the last, knocking out an American tank and killing an American infantryman before they were wiped out. Prior to 1939, the stadium looked like this as Hitler spurred his country to brutal attempts at world conquest. awards Congressional Medals of Honor to two officers and three enlisted men of the 3rd Infantry Division. Twenty-second April, 1945. To prevent the Nazis from consolidating what is left of their southern armies for a last-ditch stand, General Patch drives directly south from Nuremberg, heading for Munich. Halfway between Nuremberg and Munich lies one of Europe's most beautiful rivers, the Danube of musical fame. Company C of the 256th Combat Engineers add a line of their own to the history of the war by throwing the first Bailey Bridge across the Danube. The event is appropriately celebrated. April, Munich is invested by elements of the 7th Army's southern wing. After only one day of light fighting, Munich falls to the 42nd and 45th Infantry and 14th Armored Division. The quick fall of Munich on 30th April was preceded by reports of street fighting inside the city between anti-Nazi patrols and SS troops. The revolt was put down by the Nazis, but surviving members of the Bavarian Freedom Committee and local citizens greet the Americans with great enthusiasm. 
Munich, with its beer halls, putsches, and discredited political history, has the reputation of being Nazism's birthplace. On May 1, General Eisenhower issues a special order of the day. The whole AEF congratulates the Seventh Army on the seizure of Munich, the cradle of the Nazi beast. Liberated Yanks in Munich get the feel of a steel helmet again. Freed prisoners include French and Polish. Hitler's SS troops did their best to force the Wehrmacht and the Volkssturm soldiers into a death battle for Munich, but without success. The remnants of the defenders, close to 5,000, marched through the streets, past the famous beer hall, and out of the war. The fall of Munich, the largest city in Bavaria, spells the doom of the so-called Southern Redoubt. To complete the splitting process, General Patch thrusts his men and armor further southward, crossing into Austria below Munich. On 2nd May, Innsbruck, deep in the Austrian Alps and 25 miles from the Brenner Pass, falls with hardly a shot being fired. Anti-Nazis, members of Austria's underground, greet the 103rd Division. While Innsbruck celebrates its liberation, other elements of the 7th Army speed toward the Brenner Pass to meet General Mark Clark's 5th U.S. Army coming up from Italy. This junction will spell the end of Nazi military power in the entire southern sector of the war. At the end of April, the first French army, having cleaned up the Black Forest, stretches across Germany to the Rhine and the Danube. The second divisional brigade goes as far as Berchtesgaden. The French first army takes Freiburg, then Stuttgart. Stuttgart, which is in the American operational zone. Truman protests to de Gaulle, who replies, here I am, here I stay. 28,000 German prisoners replaced the liberated French prisoners in the prison camp. For five years they waited for this day, never doubting that they would be freed by French soldiers. Moving from one chateau to another, the Vichy government has been operating from Sigmaringen on the Danube. But Pétain and Laval have separated. Pétain is in Switzerland, and Laval in Spain by the time the 5th Armoured Division arrives on April the 22nd. The 2nd, waiting impatiently in France, demands to be in at the kill. On April the 29th, Leclerc comes into Germany with one idea at the back of his mind, to capture Hitler's lair at Berchtesgaden. Officer Cadet Jean Raison. It was victory. It was the end, the end of a long road of a ride that we had taken for the oldest among us since the Sahara, into the heart of Nazidom. We all hoped and believed it, and truly all the world had done its best towards it. One was even afraid at any given moment of the possibility of armistice. On the 4th of May, the spearhead of the 2nd took Berchtesgarten railway station. Behind a bit, close to the square, you see this train. We found the train completely closed. Sticking our noses in, as usual, some of us went to look inside. To our amazement, we found it stuffed with provisions, wines, pictures, all sorts of treasures. It was Göring's train. In the utter chaos of Germany in 1945, he had been moving his possessions from Karin Hall to Berchtesgaden. With the loot that Goering has pillaged all across Europe, from
from the churches, from the museums, the Cranachs, the Rembrandts, the Renoirs, the Manets, and ingots of gold, tons of gold. Captain Tuera is the first to enter the Berghof, Hitler's villa above the town. He precedes Officer Cadet Raison. It's here, exactly. This is where Hitler's villa was. You can only see the foundations, the ruins. There's not much left. Hitler had abandoned his villa, the ruins of his home, symbolic of all that was happening in Germany. The villa had been prepared for extraordinary events. Escape corridors ran through multi-level basements, which were protected by special defense posts equipped with automatic weapons. Occupants had left hurriedly, and only the debris of the master's possessions remained. No one had stayed to salvage the treasures accumulated by the conqueror of Europe. No faithful servant remained behind to greet the new occupant. The Allied troops moved through the house as if it were haunted. So far, so good, General Leclerc said to his men. But we must go up there, to the nest of the eagle, where Hitler felt he dominated the world. With men of the Chad Infantry Battalion, Tuera and Raison take five hours to scale the rock, and at 6.30 p.m., they plant the flag of free France. Uh, it was a, an enormous room, very pretty, with a great fireplace and a magnificent view. The cloth was laid on the table. We discussed it, and I must confess that, well, we took a few things. This is what I found and hid for 27 years at the bottom of my chest of drawers. You see the monogram, A-H. Why did I take this and not the others? Well, that's how it was. We were rushed. A serviette, this serviette, which was part of a table set, a H, and the big tablecloth. I put it in my belt, too. It replaced the flag. With the Allies and the Russians drawing within range of each other, both forces had to use extreme caution to keep from finding themselves suddenly firing into or overrunning the other's lines. Russian liaison officers served with the Western Allied Force and kept Soviet commanders informed of the advance of the British and American frontline troops. On April 25th, patrols of the 69th Division of the 5th Corps met elements of the Red Army's 58th Guards Division on the Elba. The meeting took place at Torgau, 75 miles south of Berlin. The Nazi Empire, which Hitler had predicted would last for a thousand years, had been crushed to death only 12 years after its beginning. The devoted Nazi party followers had run the gamut from fanatical mass hysteria following their early victories to humiliating total defeat. In late April, the first official surrender by a Nazi area command took place at Caserta, Italy. The envoys of the top Nazi generals in the Italian theater surrendered unconditionally to the Allies on April 29th. The German surrender of Nazi-held territory in Italy and Austria was to become effective at noon on the 2nd of May. In the north, at Luneburg Heath, on May 4th, the Germans surrendered to the Allies, represented by Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery, all their forces in northwestern Europe, except for the Nazi garrison in Norway. Complete Nazi capitulation came on May 7th at Reims, when the Allies, represented by General Eisenhower's Chief of Staff, General Walter Bedell Smith, accepted the surrender of Colonel General Alfred Jodl on behalf of the Nazi High Command. All hostilities were to cease at midnight on May 8th. 
The surrender instrument was signed by Yodel at 2.41 in the morning of May 7, 1945. The campaigns in the Mediterranean and in Europe had no prior parallel in the history of warfare. Throughout them, the United States Army had engaged in operations without comparable precedent since its establishment in 1775. Finally, on May 7th, 1945, while happy crowds demonstrated in city after city, President Harry S. Truman made a joyful announcement. This is a solemn but glorious hour. I only wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. For this victory, we join in offering our thanks to Providence which has guided and sustained us through the dark days of adversity and into light. General Omar Bradley moved in at the head of his occupying force to take over the American sector of Berlin and Germany as decreed by the historic Potsdam Conference. German citizens watched with ill-concealed relief the transference of the command from Russia to the U.S. Now the problems of occupation began and for the GI, the uncomfortable problem of a non-fraternization rule, a rule that was not designed with a lonely American soldier in mind. But it proved to be a rule that had been spawned out of the bitterness of war, and as such had no place in the peacetime world. As the U.S. shaped its plans for aiding the defeated country of Germany to regain its feet, the law against fraternization dissolved. Americans and Germans met on the social as well as the government level. Education became the keynote of the occupation forces. German youth became the target for the U.S. rehabilitation plans. American edited school books and American trained teachers took over the task of re-educating the German young generation in the ways of democracy. The old way of Nazism still hung on in the person of a few fascist diehards. U.S. military government teams rooted them out in lightning raids that came without warning. Under the Allied occupation, a new Germany was to rise from the ashes of the Third Reich. Some 40 miles southeast of Nancy, French armor moves in for the cleanup around Epinal, capital of the department of Vosges. On 12th September, they approach the town of Vittel, a famous French watering place, and attack German points of resistance. troops who moved up from the south for a junction with Allied northern forces helped to narrow the pocket of Nazi retreat through the Belfort Gap. 30 German tanks were knocked out at the village of Dompere. American aircraft cooperated with the 2nd French Armored Division. German prisoners bury their dead after the occupation of Dompere, 14th September. The 7th Army Infantry spearheads the drive above Belfort and the gap to southwestern Germany. On 23rd September, they advance near the important highway junction of Remiremont, 14 miles south of Epinal. From Remiremont, the attack spreads out along highways leading to the Vosges Passes. Moving up to cross the Moselle River, engineer units working in the area help to assure safe and rapid passage for the troops. Ammo is held high and dry as the men wade in. Guide ropes have been rigged up to help the infantrymen across. A 
Assault boats are put into service as the order comes to rush the whole battalion across as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, trucks ford the river, coming back empty to pick up another load of troops. The advance continues. It's reported that snow faces units fighting their way toward the western slopes of the Vosges. The earliest and harshest winter in 80 years comes to northern Europe. Snow camouflages the terrain from the Dutch lowlands to the icy passes of the Vosges. Here, awaiting the mid-November general offensive, gunners of a French division cooperating with the 7th Army stand guard at their emplacements. In Belfort, France, at the southern end of the 450-mile front, the German garrison is almost completely wiped out as the French First Army takes over on 22nd November. The Nazis had been attempting to stem the Allied push so that their troops in the Vosges Mountains could escape across the Rhine. The combined drives of the American 7th Army and the French troops had made enemy positions in these mountains untenable. The seizure of Balfour is climaxed by an attack on fanatically resisting troops in the Chateau de Balfour, 17th century fortification. Commando d'Afrique man a 57 mm gun. After its fall on the morning of the 25th, the fort area is inspected by Major General Armand Chaillet, commanding French artillery. From the chateau's roof, the general looks out upon the captured city of Belfort. German prisoners are marched through the streets. While Belfort was being reduced, Malouz had also been taken by French units who entered the Alsatian city after reaching the Rhine. Malouz, the first large city in the path of the French advance up the Rhine Valley, has a population of around 100,000. By 23rd November, most of the city was freed of Germans except the Hermann Goering barracks which held out for several days. Tanks blast Nazi strong points. Prisoners continues even after Malouz is won. They're comprised of Nazi patrols which slipped into the city at night. As late as 10th December, German soldiers were still being removed from hiding places. Several hundred miles south of Aachen, Alsatians fight flames in villages to which the Nazis set the torch before fleeing the area above the Swiss border. An advance spearheaded by the 1st French Army has succeeded in turning the flank of German positions in the Vosges. The breakthrough brings elements of the 6th Army Group to Malouz and the west bank of the Rhine. Additional films of the Malouz siege show final skirmishes leading up to the city's liberation. The civilian population of 10,000 has taken shelter in the cellars of houses and factories. The bag of prisoners includes a number of officers. Part of the staff of the German 19th Army were taken prisoner at Malouz. Alsatian patriots parade into the freed city. During the German occupation, they were subjected to forced labor. While Malouz is being reduced, Saarburg at the north end of the sector falls to 7th Army units. The swiftness of the advance by General Patch's troops forces the enemy to abandon many weapons. Due east of Saarburg lies Sabern, which is captured on 22nd November. On the following day, Strasbourg is reached. At Saint-Dee, important highway terminus below Strasbourg, roadblocks were built by the Germans to stem the Vosges offensive.
An abandoned 77-millimeter howitzer overlooks the only roadway leading to the summit. 81-millimeter mortars apparently rushed into position as the Americans approached. Captured Russian machine guns, approximately caliber 30. The Nazis also used captured Russian ammo. In addition to the gun emplacements, the Nazi defenses included a system of trenches, the construction of which was interrupted by the entry of our troops. Additional evidence of enemy precautions before the Rhine plane at Imwing in the Saarburg sector. Camouflage 20.3 centimeter guns. The enemy's materiel losses have mounted with each new push by the combined French-American armies northeast of the Belfort Gap. Here, a wooden framework and haystack were used to conceal the 20.3 centimeter weapon. At Strasbourg on 26th November, a total of approximately 10,000 prisoners are ready to be moved to the rear, included as General Fatterot, commander of the Strasbourg garrison. The officers and men will be transported southwest to Apinau, from whence they will be sent to Allied internment camps. Women prisoners, members of the Nazi equivalent of the WAC, several German army nurses are included. At Apinal, on the way to the rear, just prior to the December German offensive, the total number of prisoners taken since D-Day was 750,000. The enemy's estimated total casualties, including killed and long-term wounded, not less than 1,200,000. Southward along the 450-mile front, the 7th Army was moving out of the Vosges passes toward the towns of Selestar and Colmar. This is Selestar, cleared of enemy troops on 5th December after three and a half days of bitter fighting on the Alsatian plain. 25 miles northeast of Selestar, American artillery emplaced on the west bank of the Rhine at Strasbourg fires across the river into Kale, Germany. The bridge connecting the two cities was blown up by the Nazis a few days before this attack of 12th December. offensive at Strasbourg continued, General Patch's forces also were active at the northern end of the salient, being driven toward the Reich border in the area around the forest of Agno. The town of Niederbronn, seven miles south of the frontier, is cleared of last snipers by infantry troops. The infantry conducts a house-by-house -house search for hidden Nazis. Even as the 7th Army units completed the cleanup at Niederbrunn, other forces were driving toward the outskirts of Agno. On 10th December, a sudden move to the east in the area south of the town took the Germans by surprise and we captured Bichevier. Elements of an infantry division enter the wrecked French town. The advance envelops the town of Oberhofen, a mile north of Bichevier and about four miles southeast of Agno. Prisoners are seized en route. Self-propelled 105 mm howitzer spearhead the attack. is penetrated by infantry units also advancing behind the 105s.
Three weeks after this action of 11th December, new Nazi counterattacks are reported against the 7th Army's positions west of the Wiesenburg Gap. Inside Strasbourg, principal French city of the Upper Rhine Valley. While on a mission to assess bomb damage at a Junkers engine plant, Air Force's cameramen make a general survey of the liberated city. Germans have always regarded Strasbourg as a German town. To control the city's estimated 25,000 male Germans and their families, strict measures are taken by Brigadier General Leclerc's French troops and other units of the U.S. 15th Army Corps. Allied air attack caused only slight damage to the 11th century cathedral. The 16th century clock will run after minor repairs. Past the cathedral on their way to a prisoner of war stockade go non-combatant Germans. Because of the large numbers of Nazis settled here since 1940, only the most notorious could be interned. Wreckage of the Junkers Aero Engine Factory one mile from the center of town. In 1940, the Nazis converted this former Ford plant to an aircraft engine repair depot. Later, manufactured power plants for the Ju-88. Between two and three hundred engines were turned out here monthly. Last 27th May, 53 B-17s of the 8th Air Force dumped 130 tons of high explosive on this target in less than three minutes. Production of engines was halted and never resumed millimeter mortar crews supporting the infantry early in February during the elimination of the German salient in the vicinity of Agno. Company M, 3rd Battalion, 313th Regiment, 79th Division, supplements its ammunition stock with German 80 millimeter shells for use in the 81 millimeter mortar. According to the company commander, the difference of one millimeter in the tube of the mortar makes accuracy of fire impossible. The objectives are enemy strong points across the Motor River. Demonstrating detection of the German non-metallic top mine, 44th Division engineers with the 7th Army try out two sweepers. The SCR-625F, which responds to metallic mines, shows no needle registration, although actually over the top mine. When the ANPRS number one encounters the same suspicious spot, its meter indicates the presence of the mine. Probing and disarming of the all-plastic wood and glass anti-tank mines are next shown. Last November, a German field manual dealing with the top mine was located and reprinted by the 15th Corps Engineer Intelligence Section. Discovery of the mine in the 44th Division sector offered the first opportunity for complete analysis. Previously, some of the mines had been found in a German stockpile, but they were minus the igniters. Here, the igniter is shown being removed. And next, the detonator. The German manual contains reference to locating of the top mine by their own troops. Mention is made of a specially adapted mine detector, Stuttgart 43, which responds to a mixture placed in the soil covering each top mine. This mixture is labeled tar sand, camouflage sand. The Germans back on the Alsace front. Under cover of an M4 tank, men of the 3rd Platoon B Company, 68th Armored Infantry, advance on a house in Oberhofen. is shelled at point-blank range. The platoon closes in. After several days fighting inside the town, this house is one of the few remaining enemy strong points. The platoon rushes the house for the final onslaught. Enemy fire has finally been silenced.
During the tank barrage, several Germans remained unharmed in the cellar. Their surrender leaves only a few isolated snipers. Before darkness, the remainder of the town is cleaned up. On 14th October, at a forward assembly area at Charmois, France, Japanese Americans of a combat team attached to a battle tried division prepare to leave for an attack on the Nazi held city of Bruyere at the southern end of the Allied battle line. The unit is made up of American citizen volunteers of Japanese ancestry, veterans of the Italian campaign. These troops, many of them former members of the Hawaiian Territorial Guards, received their training at Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Arriving in the Bruyere sector, 40 miles north of the Belfort Gap, Troops continue to the front on foot. Attacking Bruyere. Falls, 19th October, opening the entrance to one of the main passes crossing the Vosges Mountains to the Rhine Plain. 